Hello YouTube, this is Morgan, Airspeed Prime here with my next uh, Korra episode commentary. This is going to be the episode commentary for K109, Out of the Past, the ninth episode of The Legend of Korra. And obviously, um, before I start, actually, I just want to say one thing. Um, some, uh, one of my uh, like subscribers on YouTube uh, asked me to give this shout out, and that is uh, Nightranger23, uh, who comments a lot on a lot of my videos and is definitely kind of one of my kind of most loyal um, subscribers and uh, I, I've definitely noticed that uh, with my videos that I have a, a lot of people who comment on a lot of them and like really seem to like a m most of my videos and that's great that I'm kind of gradually kind of building up this um, um, group of kind of loyal followers and uh, hopefully that, that will grow kind of uh, as I continue to put out videos but uh, Really, it's it's not about the quantity for me. It's just that like I like to know that like some at least some people are watching my videos. Um, and the the shout out is basically that it was his birthday yesterday, the tenth of November. So happy birthday, Night Ranger twenty three. Now, on to uh, this video. Um, obviously, as usual, the this episode commentary is going to start with the opening of the episode, the Fire Earth Air Water bit. So prepare episode nine uh, up to that point, and then I'm going to pause uh, this. Uh, from talking for a moment and then I'm going to, uh, when I start speaking again, that will be when you press play on the episode and then you'll be all synced up with what I have to say. Uh, my voice uh, sounds a bit, uh, I, I suppose, raspy or something like that throughout this because um, I just have a bit of a kind of sore throat uh, at the moment, so uh, ex so you'll excuse me if there's a bit of like uh, coughing clearing my throat at points and I get a bit kind of like... <laughs> Uh, or anything like that, but um, yeah, I'm gonna start ta stop talking now. When I start speaking again, that is the time to press play on the episode. So here's my episode commentary for K109, out of the past, the ninth episode of the Legend of Korra, and obviously this is a very important episode in that. This is the episode where Korra finally figures out what her visions are about. She gets the kind of full picture of those visions, and it's uh, very interesting in this episode because um, because of like Korra being captured, it basically puts her in the position where there's nothing to distract her from anything but just meditating on that. So in the end, like her being captured actually kind of helps her in the end, like figure out like her um, visions and stuff like this, but. You know, the last episode ended with a huge cliffhanger of, you know, <laughs> uh, Tarlock uh, capturing Korra, bringing her to this kind of, like, outpost on the edge of the cabin on the edge of the city, putting her in this metal cage. And he starts off with this really creepy bloodbending scene here, as, like, he's, like, a bloodbending Korra, like, in the air, and she just looks absolutely petrified. And it's just such a creepy scene, and um, it's just, like... But again, it like shows like how did Nick allow him to do that scene at the start of this? Like he's in complete control of her, and just like locks her here and leaves her there. It's just crazy. Then he goes off back to the city, and like what he does basically is that like he rigs the the, the kind of fight scene from last episode up so that it looks like she was attacked by G blockers and captured by them. So it just makes Tarla such this big creep, this big villain there, and huge stuff going on. And then this is a nice like family scene, you know, Milo uh, just kind of sleeping with his parents there. He's the one who answers the phone. Lo I love what he says, like, this better be important. Classic way to answer the phone. And he finds out over the phone what happened. I immediately go to the crime scene. <laughs> And obviously, like, there's all the evidence planted, the equalist loves, the uh, big bolos. Tarlock being healed from his attack, who was actually by Korra, which was interesting. It's interesting that no one asks about the burn on his arm, like, the... Oh, no, sorry. One mistake. That's obviously the burn from the equalist shock gloves. And then, like, I like the way, as he's explaining in a way, it shows the, the flashback of him, like, uh, doing all this, setting up all this evidence. It's just so, kind of, makes Tarlock a very clever character, and also, like, just such a villain. And you just hate him so much. And especially, like, when you find out, like, about his past, you sort of understand it, but not not really. And then we finally get back to Lin Bai Fang, who was obviously injured, um, 
Uh, basically, after the kind of Hiroshi Sato kind of incident, when I found out about him, she was injured, she's recovering, and she's finally thinks that it's time to get back to work. Time to put her armor back on. I love the way it's kind of done, all metal bending style, the way she puts it on. Doesn't like really just use her hands to put any of it on. But she gets rid of the uh, metal bender police badge because she's rogue now. Cloak on. Statue of Toph. It's just, uh. And then the Sammy's rescued by, um. <laughs> Lynn. It's a nice thing. I <laughs> mean, they just kind of casually walk out. Really funny scene, like, <laughs> Bolin just going to the toilet in the corner. As the two ladies walk in, it's just a brilliant scene. Really nice scene. And obviously they then find out about what happened to Korra, and this is where Mako, you know, really begins to show, like, um, how much he cares for Korra. You know, that's, that line was fine, like, he cares about it. That's another funny scene, the whole fly thing. <laughs> Zipper, uh, metal bending is just such a nice scene. I see the aggression of Korra here. She just, like, violently attacks the door of the cell. And, like, that's her kind of style, her kind of physical style. She just wants to, like, break through stuff, use her bending to, like, break out. When... What's gonna help her here is like meditating, thinking really, like um, having a bit of patience. And that's all she can do right here. She can only meditate, that's all she can do. She's not gonna break out. And it helps her to connect with the uh, Aang and basically find out this vision that she's getting. And we could see it in full here, we could see like Aang speak pretty much for the first time. Older Toph and Aang's voice are so well done, it, it works so well. It's not like really deep for Aang, that would make it seem really odd, but it's still got that kind of bit of like funness to it, like it's not that deep, it makes it really feel like Aang. And the whole Twinkle Toes reference just there is really well done, and it's like, I'm 40 years old. And there's your Cone, who's going to like come in and play a huge role basically in the final few episodes, even though he's not like around really. And we see that bloodbending is this huge thing in the city now, like, like he's a bloodbender, and they're making, like, it's like the worst crime you could possibly commit in the city, city bloodbending, controlling people, like, against their will, it's just incredible. And Cora's kind of just wondering, like, what exactly, where exactly is this uh, kind of vision leading? And in the end, what it's going to lead to is it's trying to warn um, Korra about bloodbending, basically, that there are people in the city who have bloodbending. Yukon's vengeance is going to come through his children. It doesn't specifically say that, but that's what it hints at. And then that's a nice little reference there that Naga is also missing. And we later find out that Naga's gone in search of Korra. It's just a nice reference that they need. And then they all kind of combine together here with with all their info that like they've, they've realized that a lot of the Eclipse stuff is underground in tunnels. So they're just going to um, use that to try and find out maybe possibly where Kor has been captured. And Lynn obviously wants to find her um, officers that were uh, taken. Oogie, yes, Sky Bison are always awesome. And then the city just looks really nice, all the kind of frost on the sides of the roads, and the kind of worn look of this part of the city, it's really nice. Seismic sense, the perfect way to find out about this. Great. And then the fact that, like, uh, Lynn can use her metal bending, basically, to remove the, uh, like, armor from her feet, and then put it instantly back on, that's just such a nice way. Like, if Toph had the kind of technology to do that, she probably would have. <laughs> It's really nicely done. And, you know, we obviously have the kind of investigation team underground. Mako lighting the way with his firebending. And this is the kind of first sign that, of, that uh, Asami sees that Mako is so intense about finding Korra when he, she asks Bolin about it.
And she's kind of using the fact that, like, uh, Iki said this to her, and Bowler now sees not a good liar. <laughs> He's like, you know something. Tell me. And le <laughs> this is where, obviously, she finds out about the kiss, and that it kind of... It happened, but it didn't. Nothing happened from there. But it kind of has really affected uh, Asami here, and her thoughts. <coughs> hmm. I see the equalists come in and the, on their motorbikes, and that kind of reveals like where their hideout is. It's like it's just a really nice scene to have, kind of cut back and forth between the kind of action of this part of the story and then the kind of more spiritual, uh, core character focused bit of like her. Um, Figure stuff out. I've seen all the different tech they have out down here, all their stuff. The trams and all that stuff. And the music just really helps to make it like seem like really dramatic. Like they're sneaking around then when they're on the train. It starts to get really, really dramatic. They arrive in. <clears throat> and uh, the fun thing is that Mike and Brian, the creators of Avatar, voiced those two uh, chi blockers there. That's a nice reference to see that they have actually voiced a character in the show. Again, size makes sense. <clears throat> and then another thing with the fact just the fact that Mako said that it shows that um, <clears throat> he's the one really intent on finding her. Bolos again. The power of airbending is just really effective against the kind of bolos that like you can just blow them away. <clears throat> hmm. And she's finally found her uh, chi blockers, her uh, officers, but she can sense that they've that uh, Amon's taken their bending away already. And it's just a really emotional scene that like she's the one who got away and they were captured and lost her bending. It's a nice um, <clears throat> one. And then another thing to show the intensity of Mako threatening the uh, guy. And here's where they find out about Tarlock from the Chi Blockers. Because they have no reason to protect Tarlock. He's against the Equalist just as much as everyone else. <laughs> and Tenzin's just like, yes, finally something to take Tarlock down with. I hate that guy. It's just really nice to do it. The music gets really dramatic here during this tram chase. <clears throat> Really powerful earth bending from Bolin. <laughs> I like the guy, the the um, officer in the background, just like mouth wide open, yeah. And then the lieutenant is all prepared for them until Lin Bai Fang does this amazing move here metal bending, earth bending, all at once, just break through the roof of the thing. And you must wonder, like, the lieutenant, he's just there, oh. I set up all my people epically like this at the end of the tunnel for no reason. They just went out through the top. Just so cleverly done. Hmm. And then just from that really action-y scene, back to this scene here. The trial of Yakone. He's a criminal. He's the leader of a criminal empire. We see that Sokka is the uh, Southern Water Tribe representative on the council. And we see that Qatar has basically made uh, bloodbending illegal in the city, and as it kind of should be, because like it, ha it's, it has such a huge impact. If like lots of waterbenders could do that, <laughs> and his lawyer uses the defense that um, <clears throat> bloodbending at um, in during the day without the uh, moon is impossible. Yet, Yukon obviously knows he has that psychic bloodbending power that he can do at any time he wants. And 
And here we get their kind of like Sokka's kind of first line. His voice is also really nice. What are you doing? Amazing combustion man reference there. And he, the line, what Sokka says here is very interesting for the whole like, universe of Avatar. In that he talks about some benders having unique abilities, like even more than just a regular bender, like tough making metal bending. She had that special connection to the earth. Combustion Man obviously had that special, like, kind of psychic fire bending power. Yakone obviously has a special water bending power. Like, Sokka just uses the fact that, okay, it's definitely happened. It may not go fit in with the usual rules of bending, but it works. And he just stands up and psychic blood bending, no hands, takes control of Sokka. <clears throat> and that's what makes this scene so amazing in that he's controlling multiple people without basically using nothing but his mind. And that just makes it so powerful. And then Aang is like pretty much the only one who can resist it in any way here. He's controlling everyone in the courtroom and then Aang's just barely kind of struggling to like keep it kind of contained. And here's the big um, scene where they try to out um, Tarlock as the villain of the piece. And like, it, they have no evidence as such right now until the page who was obviously present while the kind of fight between Tarlock and Korra happened arrives on the scene. And like that, <clears throat> that character, the page, has gone from being like the person who was annoying Korra in an episode you, re you really hate to being like this character. You're like, yes, you have some strength of character. You came out against Tarlock. And then the revelation of like, like he used bloodbending. He's gonna say in a second. And then everyone's instantly on like on edge against him because he's got this incredible power. Everyone gets into their fighting stances against him. And we kind of see here that Tarlock is a very powerful bloodbender, but not as powerful as his father because he's not. He has to use his hands in some part to do it. He can take out so a lot of people at once, like he does here, knocking them out with the bending and he just escapes. And just a little funny moment from Bolin here. He's like, it's so crazy, like for him being a bloodbender, that's what how Chorus happened. <laughs> and he thought it was just a dream. And now everyone's kinda on the right side against Tarlock. His whole plan has gone up in flames because he was outed as a uh, uh, bloodbending because of the pressure from Korra and then like the page finding out about it he's kind of had to be outed and then back to the flashback and it's just such a dramatic moment like seeing like basically our whole group of heroes you know Katara's not there Zuko's not there but some of the most powerful benders we've ever seen like Toph uh, uh, Aang and then a really powerful warrior like uh, Sokka just taken out so easily and then the attention like comes to Aang, and he's just about struggling through it. He can still manage to talk, not completely helpless. And he just kind of like nearly knocks Aang out and flees. And here's this amazing scene: Aang, you know, activates the Avatar state. You know, he's in control of it here. You know, he just activates it for a second to create the huge air scooter here and goes after um, Yukon. Sometime like during this, he like deactivates it, and then obviously just uh, takes out the cart and confronts Yakon. And then the next scene coming up here is just so violent and just like when I first saw this, I was like, "Oh my god!" Like, has he just horribly injured Ang? Because look at the crazy angles that his uh, like arms and legs are at. It's even his like neck. It's just incredible. Like just lifts him up into the air. Like look at the angle that like his knee is at, and like some of his like elbows. Look, look at his arm, like wrist. It's just, it's just so like horrifying to watch. 
And then the defense mechanism avatar state activates because he's in like life threatening danger. He then quickly deactivates it because he's in control. And then energy bends your cone amazingly well. And you know, give it like this scene is actually very important when we come to skeletons in the closet and we get the backstory in that. Like the the one thing almost like more powerful than any bending ability is the, the ability to take away someone's bending. So energy bending is a hugely important car uh, power. And she finds it like he's trying to warn me about Tarlock. Though the vision was actually to warn her about Tarlock and Amon. And basically that both villains of this kind of story, their origin is in Yakon. And we see that Tarlock had a different approach to taking over the city. He tried to do it, like, the right way, with only minor kind of corruption. While Yukon did it as a criminal, like, mastermind. And, like, when you get the fact that Tarlock was against the whole thing, he was uh, a kind of a reluctant bloodbender. He, he never wanted to really control people. It's really shocking. And then, like, out of nowhere in this episode, just the most shocking thing ever to happen. Like, no one was expecting it to happen. Tarlock's the big villain of this episode. And then suddenly Amon just appears and, like, oh no, what's going to happen? And you you think, like, oh my god, he's going to take down Amon. And then Amon can resist the bloodbending. And you're just like, what is he? And this is where all the theories, like, when the show first aired and we didn't, we haven't seen, like, 10, 11, and 12 yet. Like, oh my god, is, like, Amon a robot? Is he a spirit? Is he something... I I don't think anyone really had the kind of uh, theory that he was a bloodbender because there was so little kind of resistance, and then he just takes away Tarlock's bending. And it, there's a big contrast between the way Amon does it and the way Ang does it because you know Ang in part used the Avatar state to do it, a spiritual thing, and he didn't. So it's very interesting. It definitely gives you the sense that it's not quite as it seems. And it, for once, Kor is very clever here. She's just not prepared. She's not just prepared to attack. She realizes that oh, she's going to get electrocuted. That and that electricity is um, kind of conducts through metal. And that if she just keeps herself in the middle of this, she won't get electrocuted. It's really clever. And then, like, she's prepared for a sneak attack because they think that she's um, unconscious. She's really clever here. Patient waits. Kind of an air, a bit of an airbender trait to her. And then really powerful bending here from Korra as she escapes. Amazing bending. And then here, in the past, she would have ran like straight at Amon and attacked him. But she realizes that she at, at this stage she need, needs to get away. So what she does is she she kind of slows him down using this uh, like powerful water bending attack and then just flees. Which is the like airbender tactic. She's beginning to learn that airbender style. Avoid and evade. It's not always the right thing to do to just stand and fight. And she flees. And then a really interesting waterbending here. She's just kind of, no surfboard or anything, just then kind of clearing the uh, snow out of her way to move around. And then you were like, oh no, what's going to happen to her? She's like trapped in the, out in the cold and like she doesn't have like that much clothes on. She's not really that warm or like bare arms, stuff like that. And then Naga arrives and you're just like, so that's what that reference was for earlier on in the episode. The great continuity, little, little setup without actually saying it earlier on. And then, you know, Korra has obviously is brought back to Republic City by her loyal polar bear dog Naga. And it's just like really like nice. The music just makes it seem like Okay, things are kind of starting to return return to normal. It's just really good, solid episode. They they locate Naga and quickly come down to find Korra. And then the the, the scene coming up here is very important for the Mako Korra relationship, Makora, and also kind of a, a, a Sami. Like she he doesn't want her to be questioned or anything like that. He just go, goes up, grabs her. You know, Asami realizes that it's. Part of at this moment, she realizes that Mako actually does care for Korra almost more than her. There is a, a connection there between the two. Um, she, she doesn't quite get it all there because um, 
she is like injured. She has just been kidnapped and brought back. So it's not like a complete like, oh, he kind of loves her and not me thing. But it's definitely interesting for the relationship thing as a whole. Um, important thing to show that Mako does have strong feelings for Korra. But he also does like Asami. So it is... Um, like, a lot of people are angry at Mako for doing this, but, like, it's, it's normal. Like, he, he he has these two girls that he does like, and he's not trying to hurt any of them. He's just, like, basically showing how he feels. He just, like, reacts. And it's just a really good, nice way to end the episode. Like, your core is uh, pretty, pretty injured, you know, she's just been captured. Like, what's going to happen from here in the rest of the series? And as we see going forward, um, Amon has his big attack next episode, and then we go into the finale. So, um... Next uh, episode commentary is going to be next week. Um, So thank you for listening and bye.